Hi, gorgeous, and welcome to the Confident, Energized, and Sexy Mama Show. I am Dorit Palvanov, your host, feminine energy expert, health coach for women, registered holistic nutritionist, and the creator of the groundbreaking health and mindset program for moms, Energized, designed for perimenopausal women who are done having kids and are ready to get their confidence, energy, and sexy back. Ladies, Think about it. What would the world look like if as women we stopped being so harsh on ourselves and instead felt more energized, powerful, confident, and more connected to our bodies? What if as women we honored the fact that we are built and wired differently than men and being different does not mean being inferior? That the go-go-go mentality alongside doing more to have more without ever pausing and resting only leads to chronic stress, anxiety, burnout, overwhelm, lack of joy, and corrodes our health, relationships, and vitality. What if as women, wives, and mothers, we had the courage and confidence to desire more, more freedom, power, energy, joy, abundance, pleasure, fun, play, and sex all on our own terms. Mama, you deserve to feel good. You deserve to form healthy relationships and your body needs, craves, and deserves pleasure. This is your birthright. You are here because you believe in your feminine energy. You're here because you care about health and the environment and you're not afraid to take action and change. You're here because you don't want to pass on a pattern of self-destruction, hiding and not speaking your truth to your daughters. You're here because you're done feeling stuck, leaving a mediocre life as a half woman. You're here because you are done struggling and frankly can no longer afford to feel like crap. Each week, I will be here for you, dropping a healthy dose of inspiration and motivation, as well as introducing you to my brilliant guests, where we will dive deep into all things womanhood, feminine power, energy, psychology, holistic and alternative health, food, nutrition, hormones, fitness, mindset, motherhood, relationships, sex, business, and much more. So mama, are you ready to take back control of your health? Let's do this. Hey gorgeous, welcome to another episode of the Confident, Energized and Sexy Mama podcast. This is Dorit Palvanov, your host. Woohoo! 150 episodes. That is amazing. (laughs) I am so proud of this show. I am so proud of this community that we are building here, community of beautiful, gorgeous, inspiring, motivating moms, women who are really committed to figuring out a way to live and coexist both as a woman and a mother together and separately, whatever it is that it means for you. I am so excited for this journey. For me personally, um, as I'm recording this, this is a very um, exciting time in my life. Um, this year I committed in 2020, I committed to taking my message bigger. Uh, and even though every cell of my body is screaming, no, don't do this (laughs) from a perspective, from a survival perspective, right? This is like a fear-based approach. My body, my, 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 uh, brain is trying to keep me safe. And we've talked about this many times on the show. Um, But really, it's really important to learn to distinguish between, um, you know, a fear response and a true intuitive uh, push uh, to, you know, to listen to your gut and and to prevent you from, to to keep you safe from something that is really not the right thing for you. And so for me, (laughs) and this is really a journey and I've you know, I truly believe that entrepreneurship, just like parenting, <laughs> it's personal growth on steroids. 
Um, and there's a lot, there's a lot that is unfolding, especially at least for me. Um, but I feel like, you know, it's time, it's time to, it's time to birth <laughs> this baby. It's time to birth this message. And also I really, one of the biggest desires for me is to show my girls, show my daughters that they can have anything that they say, set their mind, their minds to into. So, so I'm going to give you a little uh, window into what's happening for me personally uh, and professionally. Also, um, I applied to speak at a fairly large competition, speaking competition here locally in Toronto. It's called Speaker Slam. And so this uh, episode is scheduled to come out on March 26th. And so this competition is going to be on March 31st. So <laughs> in a few days. Um, and this is really, uh, it's a great platform for leaders and for people who have messages and are in aspiring to maybe be get, uh, going viral, um, you know, via social media and different tools, um, but also to challenge themselves to speak publicly about their message. And so for me, um, it is scary, but also very inspiring and I'm actually excited to uh, be on stage. I personally don't really have a stage fright. Like I, I'm totally okay to stand on the stage and speak and be vocal about what it is that I feel and think. Um, but what scares me is the quality of the message. Um, and that is definitely something that <laughs> I've been working a lot on. Like I've just spent days and days um, honing into my message. And I only have six minutes to say, you know, the core of what it is that I do and what it is that I help and my story, right? This is a competition for, um, really it's a storytelling competition. So really how to... Um, infuse my story and my motherhood story and my becoming from, you know, um, how to, how, how I've emerged from, um, you know, not being a mom and then be, being a mom and how to embody and embrace and integrate as a stronger person, as a, as a stronger woman, and really how to, um, embody my feminine superpowers, uh, how to live in alignment with the feminine current and all of those things. And, it's in six minutes, it's definitely a challenge, but it was a challenge I was ready to um, face and hopefully I'm going to do a good job. Uh, this time I did follow my best um, coach. You know how I say that our bodies are best health coach, mindset coach, relationship coach, money coach, like every, anything. And so my body had taught me, especially through births, the, the very different births uh, of my kids. I'm actually going to talk more about my personal stories because I've realized as I was writing the, these stories for this speech that I've never shared these things for, with you. And so definitely I'm going to share more. But from my birth stories, what I've learned is that uh, because all, each one of them was so different, my first one, my first daughter was born at the hospital. My second was born at home with the midwife, but without a doula. And it was, you know, really, really, really a painful uh, lesson that I learned third time I had a midwife and a doula and that was my best birth it was actually my longest but my best birth in terms of like that's I felt really empowered and I felt really strong um and I actually experienced what I wanted to experience so much which was uh an orgasmic birth and the only way this happened for me was through leaning in to help hiring help um accepting health, being receptive to health. I felt really, really supported. I felt held. I felt seen. And when we are going through a birthing experience, whether it is literally birthing a child or birthing an idea, you know, uh, maybe writing a book or starting a business or even, you know, in your motherhood experience, 
it is a birth and contractions are painful, <laughs> right? And so it's the, it's the realizing uh, for me how important the community aspect is for me, how much I need to, you know, support, how much I, I need to be constantly putting myself in a space where I ask for support and I, um, and I accept it and I receive it. And it's really kind of like the shedding of my ego. And so with this speech, that's what I've done. I've reached, I mean, I've had so many people help me and it was amazing. It was incredible. And I'm super excited for you to hear it. Um, yeah, it's going to be incredible. I, I just know that it will be. And it's regardless if I'm going to win this sh this competition or not. The, the, the main point for me is that I challenged myself. I stood there. Um, you know, 200 plus people are going to be in this audience. So 200 plus people are going to hear it. Hopefully they will be inspired. Hopefully they will share. And, you know, it's a ripple effect from, the, from there. Anyhow... Back to today's episode, today's uh, interview, I actually have a conversation for you that is very much in alignment with what I was talking about, you know, this whole idea of living in the space, like coexisting as a mom and a woman at the same time. And for me, I've, the best way that, that I could find flow, um, to really enjoy my life at, at the same time and at the same time enjoying my kids' childhoods, uh, it was through using, really tuning into the four phases of my menstrual cycle and, um, you know, using the framework that I call the, the, the feminine current. And so today, um, and we've spoken, you know, if you're listening to this episode, to this podcast, You've heard me uh, talk with um, uh, episode 142 was about honing into the wild power uh, in your body. So really honing in uh, with the energies of your cycle. And then I've had an interview with Jen Pike. So episode 140, where we talked about how to move in alignment with your cycle. And today I wanted to um, talk about the the food aspect right so, so this food supplementations like how to actually take this and really turn it into your best healing framework and your best self care um, framework as well and so I'm super super excited to introduce you to Dr Alex Golden she's the co founder of Zesty Ginger Together with her partner, Megan Blacksmith, they teach women how to live in alignment with the four phases of their menstrual cycle. Dr. Golden is known for her integrative MD approach to health through both functional and conventional medicine and for teaching women the tools they need to be their own health advocates. You are going to love, capital L-O-V-E, this interview. We have covered so much important points you need to know about as a woman. This episode is an absolute must listen and I highly encourage you to go back and re-listen as many times as you need because Dr. Golden dropped some amazing nuggets of wisdom and and it's a lot it's this episode is long it's more than an hour and so I highly recommend for you to um, you know, to give it a listen one time and then for sure come back again and even, you know, write in your notebook or wherever, <laughs> maybe in your phone, um, you know, the time for when she mentioned something that really resonated with you so that you can go back and re-listen without listening to the whole thing. I personally have learned so much from Dr. Golden. She's incredibly wise and intelligent and her life's journey is inspiring on so many levels. She and I actually both have a Russian background, which I didn't know. Um, and we talk about that too, um, how to navigate the Russian mentality and culture. Healing from the Soviet upbringing is really not an easy task. And I even personally, I didn't even, I didn't even know that it's something that needed to be healed from. Uh, but the Soviet style of parenting is ridden with shame it's ridden with criticism structure and a distance between parent and child and so this is not an easy beast to dismantle and heal from and we both are still working on that so we 
definitely we covered that. Some of the highlights from today's episodes, like I mentioned, uh, uh, you will hear Alex share her story and her journey, um, healing from chronic pain all the way through her current work with women, um, the heartbreak of not having children, navigating a conversation with her husband, parents, in-laws, and the pressure of that. Again, keep in mind the context of, you know, coming from the Soviet uh, mentality. And then we talked about the curse of the good girl and the grieving her so we can step into our best selves as women. Also, how Alex and Me- Megan have discovered working with the four phases. That was pretty incredible. Every time a woman shares her story of finding the four phases and how you know they've incorporated that into their lives, it's fascinating to me. So I absolutely love that. Also, we talked about what makes the four phases work and the practice of trusting yourself as a woman, the differentiation between owning your power as a woman and what you think you should be able to do uh, compared to men. So of course, we touched on that as well. And the meat of the episode, which is why I actually invited her to this to the interview, was uh, we talked about hormone balancing and working with the four phases of the menstrual cycle um, to achieve two overarching goals. Number one is to optimize inflammatory cascades in the body, which and and this is uh, phases one and two, and we get much deeper into details in the episodes. Uh, And uh, the second goal is to optimize natural detoxification functions for a healthy metabolism and to properly process and remove hormones and hormone mimicking substances, which is phases three and four. So this is the meat of the episode for sure, for sure. Make sure to listen to that. And then we ended up with what to do if you don't have a menstrual cycle and um, and of course, she mentioned also what's behind the name Zested Ginger, which is, I think, it's super fun. And then my favorite part of the interview is questions about her as a woman. And so we covered what makes her feel confident, energized, sexy, as well as her relationship with her mom and also um, her life purpose. And we talked about her challenges as a wife and a woman and also oh I loved when she talked about her no negotiables and how she takes care of herself and her definition of feminine power this episode is by far my favorite and uh, even though I love all of my interviews this one was very special to me hope I hope you enjoy it as much as I did The show notes for this episode can be found over at my website, www.doritpalvanov.com forward slash podcast forward slash 150. So without further ado, here is my interview with Dr. Alex Golden. Enjoy. Hi, Alex. Welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so excited to have you here too. Um, you know, since I started working with mamas, uh, I, I just had seen the explosion of podcasts um, that started appearing and, and uh, that in, in inspire and empower women all about, uh, you know, our body and health and women's health and hormones. And your podcast is one of my favorites. So Aww, I'm so, so excited. Yeah, I'm so excited to have you on um, to talk about the four phases, the four cycles. I mean, we've spoken about this many, many times on the podcast, but you're, I, you know, I'm really excited to hear your perspective. But before we do, I always like to start with the story and the background and what what brings two beautiful women to do this kind of work. Because I mean, let's be honest, this is not an easy job to do. <laughs> Um, to go against the grain and go against, you know, what we are normally taught, whether it's at school or even, you know, professionally. So share your story, share your background, and then we'll get to the questions later. Totally. Yeah. So my story and Megan's story, um, it's very, we're very much kind of a prototypical story of, of a lot of your listeners. It's, our stories are essentially, if you boil them down, 
a journey from complete disempowerment, disconnection with our bodies to, you know, the only way we could truly answer that is exactly what you said, is to figure out how to flip that around and step into feeling empowered to take action for our bodies and actually enjoy them in the way that we were supposed to that we are meant to enjoy this like amazing piece of machinery uh, that we have. So, um, you know, for on my side, uh, I was growing up um, pretty normal kid. And then um, when I went to college was where all of a sudden things drastically shifted. Now, I had always had super horrible periods, but they were like, at the time, I just thought that was normal. What I thought that that's what periods were like, um, and so that's why I say like childhood it was normal, but I've never I had never had a normal period. And then when I got to college, then I started having pelvic pain, and at first it was with my period, and it would kind of linger over, and then it got more and more, and then all of a sudden it just turned into chronic pelvic pain, and. Um, I, I went from doctor to doctor to doctor, to, like the list is so long. Um, and I was pretty much dismissed. It was like, yeah, um, you can either go on birth control or, you know, you can hear some ibuprofen. But a lot of times I was told it was in my head, your labs are fine. End of story. So a um, couple years go by and, um, and, you know, things weren't getting better, they were getting worse. So then my the pain syndrome that I then developed is called central pain syndrome, where essentially your central nervous system has a malfunctioning pain response in the body. And so even though there's not a physical problem, the central nervous essential the central nervous system essentially continues and propagates that pain syndrome. So then it became all over my body. Like I couldn't let clothes touch my skin. I couldn't have like el elastic waistbands touching me. Um, I couldn't sit, ride a bike, you know, have sex. All of it kind of went out the window. And that's when, from that point, I, I was a piano major, actually. I was going to be a piano performance professor at a university. That was kind of like my dream. And when all this went down and I kept going to physicians and like doing what I thought I was supposed to be doing, I, I just had this moment where I was so tired of crying about it and feeling disempowered that I was like, as someone has to do this better. So that's when I decided to switch gears um, and go to medical school. So I finished college as a piano performance major, you know, took all my prereqs and then went to medical school, did anesthesia residency, and, and now I'm finishing up a fellowship um, in chronic pain where my goal is to help young women with chronic pain. So eventually I just was like, you know what, if no one else is going to do this, me is going to do it. So then I, <laughs> um, I did. And so that's kind of the journey I've been on. But even within there, um, things it wasn't a smooth ride. It wasn't like I, I started feeling better just because I went to medical school. In fact, things got worse. So by 27, my husband and I had been trying to conceive for um, over a year at that point. And I went in, I told the reproductive endocrinology, uh, endocrinologist my story. And she was like, um, okay, you know, you're 27. The I'm sure you're fine, but we'll check some labs. And the labs came back and she said, oh my gosh, you know, you're going into menopause. Um, and we probably missed endometriosis the entire time. You have six months to try to have a baby and then that's going to be it for you. So that, that only worsened this like experience of, I was going to get help. I was doing everything I was supposed to be doing. I had like gone to school, found a nice man, <laughs> married him, you know, decided to have kids. And then that was just such like a kick in the soft stuff on, yeah. on being let down and being like, wow, th this is it. This has been missed and there's nothing, there's no other options for you. So I had surgery for endometriosis. They, turns out all my organs were stuck together. So they unstuck them. And then I did three rounds of IVF, which were not successful. And, and at that point, that's when Megan and I had met and we were, we started essentially, Megan had been on her own health journey. I was 
you know, going through this, but also tr- I had already found functional medicine and I was trying to incorporate that. And that's really when Megan and I got together and developed, we always kind of half joke that I'm our worst um, client. And so in the process of her helping me, me helping her, she had just had a baby and, you know, what was dealing with postpartum. And she had had a really bad postpartum experience the first time, which I can talk a little bit about. And so together we started developing this way of talking to women, helping women. And from then on, it's been years of us doing this work. And so more and more, we're developing ways to empower women to not have these experiences where they're not in control of their body. They're not being helped to understand how their body works. And so they feel guilt, they feel bad about themselves, all the emotions that I had, we know other people are having. And so um, for me from that, it's been really pretty amazing because I recovered ovarian function. I have not gone into menopause. Um, I ovulate pretty much every cycle even though I, you know, I only have half an ovary on either side, but at the same time, it go, you know, to me, it really goes to show how much functionality someone can still have, even though their anatomy is not perfect and mine isn't by any means. And so, as we've kind of grown and recovered, then we've been bringing all of this information to other women. Oh, what a story! Mm-hmm. Um, I. I I 27 to discover that I, I, I'm just trying to think in my head. I mean, that is on its own so hard to hear and oh to, gosh, yeah. and to integrate. And then the conversation that you, and I, I totally assume you tell me how that went for you. The conversation that you are about to have with your spouse, you know, like yeah. around, honey, we are not having kids like that's Yeah. And, and yeah, I had, you know, my, f- I'm Russian. I, I moved here when I was seven with my family and, um, I'm you Russian know, I- too. That's so really? cool. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, nice. Who knew? Um, yeah, that's funny. So yeah, I moved when I was seven from Chilabinsk and, um, what, and maybe you can relate to this is that, um, totally. the culture is like, you are getting married and you're having kids. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes. See, this is, I usually have to explain this, but you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yes, it's like, totally. mom would, you know, give me like my stuffed animals and be like, Oh, you're going to have a baby and you're going to be a mom someday. And like, that was so ingrained in me. Yeah. I will say that was probably the worst heartbreak of my entire life. I mean, like, mm-hmm. you know, I've had stuff happen and traumas and things like that. But, um, I think the thing that people don't, recognize is that it goes so much farther beyond you. Yeah. It was like dashing my husband's hopes and he had never planned to adopt. And, you know, then we were starting to have that discussion. And so that caused problems between us, um, you know, to really figure that out. And then dashing my parents' dreams of having grandkids. Cause my mom had been like, well, I've done my part. I made the kids. Now it's yeah. your job to make the grandkids. Right. Yeah. It's all on there. And, and she's like, Oh my gosh, I'm not, you know, potentially not going to be a grandmother like in the way that I thought. And, um, my husband's parents were also like, I remember them the year, uh, it was February when I found out the new years before then we were all together and they were toasting to like the baby that was going to come. Right. And so to me, I just was like, it just felt like so much pressure on my <laughs> ovaries and uterus and you know what I mean I was just like oh my god like if this doesn't work I I mean all these people are gonna be so disappointed which of course is I mean in a way it's silly like they're gonna love us anyways and and that was fine but it is so much like weight that I don't I my reproductive endocrinologist was a wonderful doctor but not necessarily the best um bedside manner. And so to, and I think I get it. I'm a doctor. Like when you're used to seeing things over and over, it becomes more matter of fact, but to just be like point blank, you're like, that's it. Menopause. Sorry. Here's some options. It was very, very jarring to me. That's for sure. And, and I think that's that feeling I have like essentially taken the essence of. And every time, you know, our business, like like you were saying, things get hard, right? It's not easy to do this work, but that kind of thought, like, this is what 
that feeling is what our women are dealing with. So anything that comes with like when someone sends like an angry email or we get a negative comment on social media, it's, it's then easier for me to go, okay, I actually know where she is and you know, hurt people, hurt people. So it's one of those things that like, it really, it, it was an invaluable um, experience for me to fuel where I'm going and what I, what I needed at the time. But certainly I would, our goal is to prevent this in other women like that shouldn't really be happening and we shouldn't have to go through that just to get like you know that that concept oh Alex I really I mean all the compassion to you all the love and light to you I I have three children I have three kids and I cannot even imagine how hard it must have been having said that I'm so proud of you for turning this into you know, into service and, and really helping women, helping us, <laughs> um, through your personal story, um, helping to empower us. Cause I think the work that you're doing, it's, it's so needed, especially now. And there is a reason why I kind of linger on, you know, um, my guests' stories. It's because you guys, are, I mean, you are a person, you are a people. Yes, you're an expert and you're great at what you do. But at the end of it, like at the heart of it, there is this story. And, yeah, um, totally. and I'm so I'm so glad. Thank you so much for sharing that. So but yeah. at, at which point and oh, before I get to that, uh, I just have to share that I think every woman, uh, you know, listening to this and myself included, there comes a point in our life where, and this for me, totally, uh, this rupture was opened for me through motherhood. Um, so that's kind of, I felt like I don't, like my life doesn't work and my life felt hard and my life didn't feel fulfilling. And I talked a lot about this on this show, um, about this piece of just some really dark moments in my life regretting motherhood like what the heck have I done to myself because it was it was just so much so for me I came to the four phases um, as a framework to help my my life become more sustainable because now everything is you know I'm, I'm synced up everywhere like my food is synced uh, my movement is synced to my cycles my so the way I socialize the way I am in the world my work is all around my cycles, my cycle. So that's how I came to it um, my, in my own personal experience. But I'm curious, when did you discover, how did you discover this framework? Um, was it a book you read? Was it a podcast you've heard? How did that happen? Yeah, I know. That's a great <laughs> question. And I did also want to just end with like, I, my, in my story, like the, it really does to me has a happy ending because like, I, I think it's important for me to say that at that time when I felt really disappointed, it was driven by, I had the mentality where I was checking off the boxes. I was supposed to, it's like, I find a nice man, check, go to school, check, you know, be nice to your parents and you know, whatever, check. And I'm going through doing whatever my, you know, hearing the Russian mom in my head um, <laughs> of what I was supposed to do. And now I realize I may not have, that may not have been the best time for me to approach motherhood. I was, you know, not in the place that I think mentally and emotionally, I was fulfilling a check mark more than um, a desire at that time. And now I feel much more equipped to go into motherhood. Like I'm, I did need a period of time to heal that IVF surgery mm. trauma. Like anyone who's been through IVF knows it's kind of an emotional roller coaster the whole time, but it really was like the right thing to have happened. And I, you know, while I don't have children, I have two amazing bulldogs and English bulldogs and I have a cat and my husband, and I have a great relationship and things like that. So I did, you know, I didn't want to leave it on a bad note is that, yeah, absolutely. Everything that you're talking about is like, you know, it, it brought it up for me so I could understand it and help. But at the same time, it, I think it was exactly the way that it needed to go. So anyone that's listening, that's like in the thick of it, 
it's all going to expand, you know, grow and unfold exactly the way that you need it. And you're going to have the realizations that you need. And it may not feel that way now. And I'm sure it doesn't, but just being on the other side of it, that's exactly, you know, I'm, I'm, truly grateful for who I had to become from that because this me is a lot happier now than that old me was even with, you know, without the problems. So that all being said, it's very important. I I wanted to ask you, are you familiar with the book, uh, The Curse of the Good Girl? by Rachel Simmons. No, but I have heard about it. And I think you're the second person now that brought it up. That's a sign that I need to be reading it. Yeah, because I I think especially for us, um, (laughs) people from the Russian culture and not even (laughs) Russian, I think we have, you know, women in all cultures are conditioned this way to be be good, to comply, Mm -hmm. to please. I mean, I see it in my girls. I have three. And yeah, I well. see it's, it's, even though, I mean, I'm aware of it. I teach it. I teach female empowerment, <laughs> but I see them just needing to be, I guess it's just part of our psyche to be good and do good and, and do what, you know, we're supposed to do. Um, and I think for you and also for me, uh, this, you know, the, the curse of the good girl when it dispels and when it just, you know, when we get the power to, you know, um, move that out of the way and the pressure of that, it's just like the energy that we get from not having to deal with this crap anymore. It's like, it gives you so much for, you know, much more, you know, much more fruitful things. So. Totally. And I, I think I had a, I think I had to mourn the death of the mm-hmm. good girl because I had in a way to, um, change who I, who my family had come to be used to me being, if that makes sense. Yes. Like they, um, the way that my mom and I interacted and the way that, um, my little, um, my, my little sister's adopted. She's 15 years old. Um, which is why I've always been like, Oh, adoption's so amazing. Like I can't imagine her not being in her family. And so I'd always been like, Oh, maybe, maybe I will. So that, you know, that was fine with me when I thought, Oh, then I'll adopt it. It, it, it wasn't that jarring. Cause I had that family connection with it. Mm. Um, but then I really had to change. And then it felt like they had to mourn that good girl going away. I had to mourn it. And then we all had to step into that new way of being. So absolutely. I hear what you're saying. It does bring the empowerment, but first it doesn't necessarily feel comfortable, but it has been great because then my relationship with my family has really grown instead, rather than me doing things out of like guilt, resentment, (laughs) feeling like I have to. Now we've come to an understanding of like, what I do, it, I happily do. And, and they know that and, and they feel that. So that I, I will have to read that book for sure. Okay. Back to what yes. you were going to okay. say about. Okay. So with the, how did we figure out the cycle? So with the, um, you know, it's interesting. I think that it's like with ideas, they seem to pop up in multiple places because we didn't read it anywhere. It was like Megan and I, as we worked with, we worked with a lot of women um, and, and we do functional lab work for them. And so as we went through the years, we started seeing really big patterns in ourselves and in our ladies. And we started noticing things like, like Megan has a story where um, her husband had a, um, a health thing and the, he, he was going to do keto. And so she was like, I'm going to do it with him to support him. And she did it once. She started on a random week. She's doing great, like carrying out the, you know, buying the new stuff and making the new stuff. And, you know, she's doing great. And then, you know, she went off of it. Uh, and then, cause again, she, she was doing it more for support, not for a medical condition. And so then, and in fact, keto in women with dysfunctional HPA axes can be very difficult. So she went, you know, she went off it and then later he was going to do it. Um, he had kind of gotten off the wagon, so she was going to do it with him. And she was like, everything felt so hard. Like getting the food was just miserable, like making the food. She didn't want it. She was craving other things. She's like, Oh my God, why is it so hard? And as we kind of unpackaged all of this, we realized 
you know, the first time she was doing it at a time in her cycle where our brain is primed for newness, execution, organization, setting things up, taking massive action. And so it was easy for her to implement that new way of being. And it, that can really apply to anything that we do. I'm just using food as, a, an, as an example. And then the second time she did it, it was the week before she was supposed to get her period. That's not the time that our brains are primed for initiation and massive action. And so it didn't feel good. It wasn't in alignment and it felt very challenging. And so this, when we started really looking at it, we then, we spent about a year and a half just developing it from our end. So I went through, I opened all my physiology textbooks. I went through research of like, what do we know about the normal cascade of hormones within a cycle? And then what is the brain doing? And what is the body optimizing at each point? And then, be t so as we learned that, then we began to see how our lives mirrored that. And after about a year and a half, that's when we started bringing it out to our community and really teaching it and being it. You know, there's other people that are talking about phases and things like that. And I think that we're all, we're all looking at the same physiology and what's happening, but we interpret it in different ways. And so ours is our developed pro, you know, the way that we look at it, but um, it is all kind of physiology based and then based off our lives and our women's lives. Love it. And when you said that, <laughs> when, that she tried keto with her husband, for me, it's been like a, a repetitive cycle. And what happened for me, and I know it happens for many, many women, is like we try and then we slip off the wagon. And then we try and then even like with like a simple thing as green shakes, I couldn't stick to any of that. Like I would start it, I would, I'd, I would be so motivated and then, you know, I just didn't feel like it. I didn't feel like cold. I didn't feel like green. I just wanted something else. And I remember feeling so much shame and guilt and what's wrong with me? And I know many, many, many women, maybe even hundred percent of us. That's a question that we ask ourselves all the time, especially being cursed as a good girl. Um, like what's wrong with me? Why can't I do this right? You know, uh, why is my partner more stable, more predictable, more, you know, linear than, than I am. And I'm like all over the place. And so I guess, Totally. Learning, yeah, learning the that framework and understanding that we are cyclical and that you know our hormones shift, shift, and really, I understanding that it's when we feed ourselves, right? Talking about blood sugar and all that, it's never just feeding our body. It's really about feeding the hormones and understanding how that works. So I think that's brilliant. Totally. Um, yeah. yeah. You want to say something? Yeah, I think that um, that is you hit, you kind of hit the nail on the head because part of what makes the phases work is that when you have an understanding roughly, then really the question becomes, how do I listen and trust the information that my body is giving me within that framework? And that's the part that is much harder for people than most people can wrap their head around the phases of the cycle and what's happening and all of that. But it's actually, I mean, it's interesting how many times our women ask us like, is it okay to do it this way? Or is it? A, and we're always like, if that's what your body is telling you to do, and that's what you truly feel like would serve you, then absolutely do it. And you don't need permission from an external source. Now there is like, you know, People always want to do it the right way, but it, there's no, you know, one of the most damaging things that being um, dismissed by providers does is it makes us not trust ourselves because, oh, that person said that it's in my head and I shouldn't feel this way. And so over time we start learning, like, don't listen to what is internal, listen to, you know, someone else. And so that's huge. And to your point of, you know, our, our brains will say, um, the, you know, I need to, 
I need to do this and why can't I stick to this habit? It's, it's because a lot of us are, are going by, are going by trying to change the external and hoping that we stick to it. Whereas in our minds, we're not the kind of person per se that has those habits. And therefore with that disconnect, our external life will never be different than what we believe in our own heads, you know? And so part of this trusting ourselves is also that discovery of who are you and who do you want to be without all of the external voices of like, we should be skinny. We should have no gray hair. We shouldn't have wrinkles. Like all that stuff is, if we go from that, those voices, those external voices in our head, and we try to change our actions, those actions never end up sticking because they're not authentic to who we believe that we are. Whereas when we change the script and we start to trust ourselves, hone in on what our internal landscape is and say, who do I actually want to be? And is that part of who that person is? does she drink green juice or whatever? Or what does she do? In that sense, then we can really start to say, do I want to do that? Or is, is just my body asking for something else and that's never going to jive. So we, we have to, we have to really parse out, you know, what is it that's being internally driven by our body as a desire and also, you know, are we covering that up with other layers of what other people expect us to be. Yes. Oh, love this so much. I could talk about this all day long. Me too. Um, <laughs> because um, to me, I mean, now being on the, on the other side, it just is so clear. But I know women who, who begin this journey, oftentimes it's like, but I just have an acne problem or I have a weight loss problem. Like, how is this related? Like, I don't need to empower myself as a woman. I don't need feminism right now. I just need to lose the freaking weight. Um, but it's, it's the unfolding of, oh my gosh, this is very much connected. And, and it's when you realize how you're wired and how you are built as a woman and how you're created as a woman. Um, there is so much in there. Uh, and I think for me, um, when I am interviewed on, on podcasts, one, one, one woman, uh, somebody who interviewed me, she, <laughs> she titled me, Dorit, it sounds like you are the feminine feminist. And it's true because feminism, I mean, it's great. It had done so much good to us, you know, women, and I'm so grateful for it. And I'm so grateful that my daughters will, you know, will have, will grow up with all these rights. And that's beautiful. But what happened in that movement, I think, um, is that we almost had to become the men that we hate in order to fight for our rights. And yeah, what I like see in the game, right. And what I see in my practice is that Yes, now I see more, you know, we have more options and more opportunities in, you know, in the world. And that's great. But I see so many women have having to pay a cost. And I the cost that I see, it's either in relationships. So it's either in their marriage, you know, uh, in their partnering with people in how they connect and how they relate or in their parenting or it could be with their health. So burnout and women who are just getting sick. And I mean, this movement of women leaving corporate, this is, I think, because women are beginning to understand that, you know, we don't have to pay this cost. You know, we can totally, you know, have all these rights and, and provide for ourselves and, and be, you know, do really amazing in, you know, at work and business while having thriving, you know, having, uh, you know, relationships that are thriving and being, you know, feeling good, having confidence in your body, having energy and feeling sexy. So totally. Add something. Totally. Yeah. The, um, you bring up an interesting point with like the acne and the weight loss when people don't want to, which by the way, I love the feminine feminist. I have always like steered clear of the whole feminist label because of what it kind of turned into. I agree. It was like 
and then be more like men, which I was like, then we're missing the point, I think, um, because both men and women are very important to this planet, yeah. but yeah. we need that feminine love, nurturing, you know, not killing the planet, providing a good home for our future generations, all of that. Um, but the, um, the stuff with the acne is, yes, absolutely. We have as a society, and this isn't even about men and women, this, this impacts men too, is that we have divorced our physical bodies with our mental bodies and our emotional bodies. And so like, for example, people will tell us like, oh, I'm not stressed. And then when we keep talking to them they're and, and asking like, well, do you worry? And they're like, oh yeah, I worry all the time. Well, you know, when we worry all the time, what physically happens is that the way our hormones are created is that the central nervous system collects 100% of what we think, feel, and experience. That means all the worrying that we're doing, the anger that we have built up, the resentment, the um, kind of ruminating on the past, worrying about the future. All of that is getting collected just as much as it's collecting the supplements you're taking, the food that you have, the sleep that you did or didn't get, caffeine or alcohol, all of it. So, you know, we tend to think of like, I'm going to take supplements, I'm going to take food, but then we don't take, pay attention to all the other things that the central nervous system is collecting. So all of that gets picked up. And then through our higher brain centers, it gets filtered through our beliefs. So, you know, in someone who's like, I, I can heal and I'm actively healing right now, that's going to be a very different filter than nothing ever works for me and I'm never going to get better, which by the way, I've been that, right? And yeah, I really too. wasn't getting better, <laughs> right? Yeah, it was like, when we talk about that identity, if I'm someone that nothing works for, then I can't have something work for me without breaking my own self identity. So I literally had painted myself in the corner of sickness and thinking that I was doing all the right stuff, yoga, breathing, you know, whatever, that none of that mattered because my beliefs did not align with that future that I wanted. And so that's the filter that it gets put through. And then the remaining information gets sent to our hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus is like a little general that sits in the center of our brain and essentially um, determines, you know, our body temperature, our circadian rhythm, our breathing um, patterns, our um, hormonal cascades, everything from thyroid, adrenals, ovarian function, liver function, gut function, all of it, right? And so when we are constantly worried, but also then being like, well, I go to yoga and I eat healthy. <laughs> None of that matters because the main signal is worry, perceived stress and, you know, overload. And so from that standpoint, you know, when we hear people really getting honed in on the physical body, the work that we actually view ourselves as having to do is allow them to see how much of them is like integrated and truly all one cohesive thing. We cannot heal acne or weight loss resistance if the body is in survival mode and the cells are shut down, the mitochondria aren't working because something is going on. There is no amount, like I, I think I need to get this tattooed on my forehead. Like we cannot out supplement the brain. We cannot out supplement the most powerful tool you have at your disposal. It will overpower anything. And so it's the internal kind of milieu of the body that, that determines how we assimilate the food we eat, the supplements that we take. A lot of people are so much in survival mode. All that stuff isn't even getting registered. You know, it's just going in and going out. That's it. And so our job is to really see, have people understand that they're not going to get away with, you know, covering up their acne without integrating all the parts of themselves because that is who they are. They're not just a physical body, but they are a mental, emotional, and spiritual being as well. And that sounds very woo, but it's ironic because that is so much more the reality that we know based on like modern physics and quantum mechanics and all of that. That is what we know, yet we are functioning as if the physical body is in a vacuum. And that, that 
you know, lack of understanding in people is what keeps them stuck and because it's so much worse to be like, I'm doing what I think is everything and being let down and then judging yourself so much worse than realizing like, oh, wow, there's a whole other world of my emotions and my thoughts and w what I believe out there that can also help me. All of a sudden, then your world is opened up. Yeah. And I think um, for women who don't really understand what you mean um, is just think about how many times have you tried something and it didn't work and you tried and it didn't work and you tried and it didn't work. And that pattern is a clear signal, at least from our point of view, that the reason it doesn't work is because you are operating from a um, fight and flight mode as opposed to rest rest and digest a place where you can actually see results. And so this is a beautiful place kind of to segue into your expertise and into talking about the four phases. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to ask you about the four phases because the women, listeners on the show already know about it. We talk, I've had guests who talked about, so I've had the uh, authors of wild power here. Uh, so for those of you who are not familiar go listen to episode 142. I've had Jen Pike here and we talked all about um, syncing the phases with the way we move the body. So that's episode 140. And I wanted to have you on because you have a very interesting uh, perspective on food. Um, and specifically, I wanted to dive deeper into um, the how you talk about detoxification and inflammation. And I'm just fascinated uh, by, you know, how the menstrual cycle is such a great uh, healing tool. I, I always tell my clients that your body is your best health coach and it's the only health coach that you have. It's just that we're not taught how to understand and decipher it and translate, you know, our symptoms. But can we go there? Can you talk about uh, optimizing natural detoxification, detoxification functions and also some, you know, how to optimize inflammatory cascades in the body? Can we go there? Totally. Absolutely. Yeah. And we have, um, for anyone who wants like a true breakdown of the site, the cycle, our um, podcast is four phase cycle podcast. Um, or if you search Zesty Ginger, it'll come up too. But essentially, season one, I created a 24 part pod class series. So it's essentially like a mini class that you're going to take on your body. And you're going to, we're going to go through everything from what your mind is doing in the cycle at each phase, which that is probably one of the most powerful things that someone can understand. But then also, yeah, food, movement, breathing exercises, rituals that you're going to do, all of it kind of start to finish. So that is a resource that we have available if you're like, what now? Like what's going on? It's it's pretty detailed, um, but they're, they're short. So, <clears throat> all right. So the, when it comes to we're essentially going to take the four phases and we're going to distill it into two halves. So phases one and two are the first half of the cycle. And so that goes from the start of your period to ovulation. And then from ovulation to the next period is phases three and four. So that first half of the cycle from the start of the period to ovulation is when our entire hormonal cascade is set up. So how that cycle is going to go is set up in the first half. That will determine, you know, the signaling from our hypothalamus, from our brain to the ovaries. And that signal sets us up for how much estrogen we're going to make. This is also why, you know, when people just give dim for high estrogen, it's not addressing that communication. Right. And then, um, then, that estrogen goes on to tell the eggs of the ovary to develop and then pick one dominant egg to be ovulated. So that entire cascade as that's happening marks the first half of the cycle. And uncontrolled or dysfunctional inflammation, which for most people it's too high, but there is still a significant minority of people who deal with too low inflammation. And that is a problem as well. So that's why we also always say optimizing because, you know, we want to cover all, all the 
um, varieties of imbalances that can happen. But essentially, high, um, dysfunctional inflammation interrupts this cascade and this communication we have that's going between our brain and down to the organ systems and sets us up for estrogen and pro progesterone production. And that, of course, determines how we feel in a lot of ways and testosterone, of course. So <clears throat> with inflammation, you know, we can eat in a way and, and incorporate things in a way that allows us to regulate that inflammation piece. And then that lets the body self-regulate. Essentially, when we're not messing with the normal cascade of things, it's more likely to happen. And so with inflammation, and inflammatory things in the first half of the cycle. Some of our favorites include adding tart cherry concentrate to your water, about a tablespoon and a big glass of water. Um, works for most people, although totally play with the ratio if it feels good to you. And just drinking that, I mean, we've had from our elixirs, people, ha they're like, whoa, I didn't think a concentrate could actually help that much, but they are very powerful. Um, and then ginger tea is another one of those um, helpers. So it, it's nice for when people brew that. Um, we like mixing ginger tea with nettle tea because essentially ginger is anti-inflammatory. And then um, nettle tea has very um, many like trace minerals and our bodies in order to get a hold of inflammation need to power our biochemical reactions with minerals and cofactors, vitamins, all of it, right? So that is, um, that blend right there can be really supportive. And then really when we have someone starting out, the first half of the cycle, we really think about hitting up the rainbow at every, in every single day. So how can we get a bigger variety of different greens, different fruits, different nuts, different, like literally I, I kind of see every meal and every snack and every trip to the grocery store as an opportunity to be like, what nutrients am I providing, right? And and on what colors am I getting? What constituents am I getting? And when we look at what we can have and what we can try and have variety in, then, you know, A, we don't get bored with our food and stuck, but also because people fall into a rut and buy the same stuff over and over. But then it also is less focus on deprivation, counting calories, going low carb, like the whole bit that's exhausting when we look at like, what are all the yummy, fun, variety of things we can have when we shift the focus, all of a sudden things feel easier. <clears throat> so, uh, and then the last one I'll leave you with is cold exposure. So <clears throat> not counting in the first three or four days of your cycle, a lot of our ladies find that when they do either cold plunges, like a cold bath, or even a two or three minute shout, cold shower, or even cryotherapy, if you want to go like the full on route, essentially when the body is submerged in cold, the in inflammatory cascade is very costly to run. It's like running an app when you're, <laughs> when you're, um, well, that's not a great analogy. Actually, I'm not going to use the cell phone analogy, but the, yeah, it's essentially interrupting it. Like I can't work on this. We got to work on the heat, right? Generation. And so then it shuts off the inflammation. When we get out, our body is then forced to kind of reevaluate. Do I need this turned on or not? So all of these things can work cohesively together because, you know, as we turn it off and ask the body to reevaluate and then support with ginger, tart, cherry juice, nettle, all of a sudden we build momentum in the right direction. All right. So, um, so does so that, that make was, sense for the yeah, first so half? That, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. So that's what I want to say. So that was uh, to do those, those are practices to, um, optimize natural detox detoxification. That so was for phase one. Or two. Oh, yeah. that's inflammation. So that's right, right. phases three and four. No, no, no. Phases one and two are for inflammation. So that oh, okay. initial cascade of um, setting up the hormones, that's all impacted by dysfunctional inflammation. So okay. that's all first half of the cycle. In the second half, the hormones that have been created have already been created. So that's once we cross over into that line, what we have then in the second half of the cycle is what we're going to be dealing with. For example, if we, if the first half of the cycle, and this happens a lot, 
there's a lot of inflammation. And so the signaling between the brain and the ovaries is wrong and we don't ovulate. Then if we don't ovulate, there's zero places that the progesterone's coming from, right? So if that setup didn't happen in the beginning, the second half of the cycle, those two weeks, unless you're supplementing or something like that, there's nowhere that the progesterone is coming from because it's either a corpus luteum that we created from ovulating or we're pregnant and, and we have that. So those are the only two options. And that's why the first, you know, that's why we do it cyclically is because each part sets you up for success and the next part. So now we're going to switch to, you know, you've crossed ovulation if things are going well, and now you're in the second half of the cycle. So after ovulation until the next period. So this portion of the cycle, now that the hormones have been created, now they're now they're being metabolized and broken down now that they're in higher quantities and the metabolism of estrogen and testosterone and all of those things determine how we feel during that time and whether we have you know estrogen dominant symptoms like pms bloating um mood swings um really heavy periods clotting cramping that whole shebang so in this you know, in the second half of the cycle, phases three and four, that's when we do things to support all of the detoxification organs. Now, many times people really just hone in on the liver, but I really think about it kind of from the outside to the inside. So it kind of goes like this, that they go in pairs, skin and lymphatics, is the first step. So our lymphatic system is our trash taking out system. By doing things like dry skin brushing, rebounding, Epsom salt soaks, infrared saunas, we help the skin release toxins and the lymphatics to move. Then it goes liver and lungs. So deep breathing is not just for relaxation, but we have metabolic functions inside our lungs. And when we exhale and inhale appropriately, we actually release things. Then liver is all when we do um, cruciferous vegetables. When we talk about adding cranberry concentrate, so tart cherry was for the inflammation in the first half. And then cranberry concentrate it's detoxification in the second half of the cycle, then, you know, we can start to get things moving in, in that way. And then the last pair is the kidneys and the colon. And this is where staying high, well hydrated, that's why we incorporate these elixirs with the tart cherry and the cranberry. And then um, why we stress the importance of, you know, staying regular and how to use like flax seeds and fiber and um, kind of parasympathetic nervous system regulation to make sure that the bowel bowels are functioning normally so we can actually get rid of all of the stuff that we have processed. So that's detoxification kind of in a nutshell. And like I said, we do have this all broken down in like, you know, 24 pod class series. So I know this is like a lot of information at once, but we just want to, we always say to our ladies, you know, as you're listening, pick one from each half, just one thing to do. Like if you just get your tart cherry and your cranberry, just start there. The beauty of this is that you have another cycle after that to try other stuff and another cycle after that. Oh, and you know what we didn't say is if you don't have a cycle, we go by the moon. So for we have a very um, similar cycle to what the moon does. So instead of getting a cycle app where you're tracking, we have our ladies get a moon app. And so the new moon is like having your period and the full moon is like having ovulation. So it's a very, very similar plan. And what's really cool, and we don't really know why this happens, but our ladies end up cycling with the moon when, when they do that. So they they won't have a period. They'll be going with the moon. And when it comes back, it'll go with the moon. So it's just a fun little we're animals so kind cool. of thing. <laughs> it's so cool. It's so, so cool. Oh, so yeah. I mean, I think there are many different people who, you know, who teach this stuff. Um, and I personally, especially as a, you know, as someone who's, who has a very full schedule plus, you know, having kids to take care of in the household and all that. Um, 
this can be very complex or this could be like a lifesaver for me it was a lifesaver but where it was really complex for me it's the remembering oh wait which cycle am i on which vegetables do i need is it like so i like how you guys simplify it into like just two um like goals the phase one and two is all about uh, optimizing inflammatory uh, in, in the inflammation inflammation responses in the body. Um, so that basically is what I need to be thinking about during um, the follicular and ovulatory phases. And then the third and fourth phase, so the luteal all the way to menstruation, is all about detoxification. So. I love it so much. I, as, as you were talking, I'm like, oh my book, a lymphatic drainage, drainage, drainage massage. <laughs> oh my gosh. Those are so phenomenal. They're so yeah. relaxing. It's wild. Um, yeah. And I've actually gotten way deep into lymphatic drainage for, I get, um, part of my chronic pain syndrome is that I get a lot of headaches. And so to drain the the brain lymphatic system is annoyingly called glymphatic system. Like they just stuck a G on the front. Like I don't even understand what they were thinking, but any case, the glymphatic system, that's been so interesting to like really drain the pressure out of my head. So I love that stuff. It's fascinating. Um, and we do have highlights on it on our Instagram. If anyone's like, I want to know about that. Um, we, we do teach that, but yeah, all of this stuff, I think it's more, it's just like learning a new language a little bit. It's like the language of your body. We're learning it. But once you get a handle on some of these simple steps of like, you know, there's a lot of details and a lot of people want to know how it works. But really, if you're like, I'm not going to worry about any of that. I'm just going to pull, you know, two things from your like nettle tea and I'll dry skin brush. Great. Do that. Because essentially what makes it easier is that rather than having to remember this huge list of stuff that you have to do for your health, which then becomes like, okay, I'm just checking off the marks of like, what am I doing for my health? Instead, you can be like, I only have to do one thing right now. Like I'm only going to do one thing at a time. I'm only going to, or I'm going to take these two things and do them one at a time. Mm -hmm. And that's totally fine. And then once you get the hang of it, you start to build a little arsenal for yourself of like, oh, I, I'm getting that headache. Like, this is what I can do for myself. And you start understanding your body. It's just practice. And I think for a lot of people, they let perfection and that external, like, I have to do this right um, to, to dominate where you cannot live in your body wrong. As long as we're listening and honoring it, there's no wrong way to do that. And so it takes the pressure off. It takes the time commitments off. Like I, I don't, I used to have so much stuff to do that it would take me like two hours to keep up with everything. And that was in and of itself kind of stressful. Um, and plus I would have resentment like, but I do all this stuff. Why am I not better? You know? And so to really take it back down to the basics and say, just going to do a little bit at a time, so much more empowering and so much easier for your life. Love it so much. I, I could have this conversation <laughs> go to so many places, uh, but I'm going to, and I know I just, I'm going to respect your time and the listeners time. Um, before, before we go to the second part of the interview, can you just say what's behind the name Zesty Ginger? Yeah, um, we so ginger has been a um, kind of a staple of ours into the way that we work. Like the ginger tea is something that um, we we like a lot. Plus, Megan always thought that was funny because she's a redhead. Mm -hmm. And so um, when we were, it really was just like, who do we want to be? And Megan and I are like we don't wear makeup. We don't use filters. We don't, you know, we're kind of like very raw. This is what you get. Our podcast, um, m very minimal editing. Or if we mess up, we're like, okay, we're human. We messed up. That's cool. Um, and so part of the like zesty, um, zesty name felt to us like an alignment with who we are, how we want to teach and just 
kind of continually bring in fun into the equation because all this stuff can seem really like medical and there's a lot of details, but at the same time, like the point of having good health is to have fun, fun yeah. have like a zesty little life. And, and if that's the case, you know, that's essentially what we want to bring to women. Love it so much. It's so beautiful. Love it. All right. Are you ready for yeah. the... Uh, okay. <laughs> I know that's the favorite part for all my guests. Okay. Yeah, exactly. so, <laughs> so, okay, Usually enough people time. just want to know about the body, so I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fine. <laughs> yeah. I know the stuff. It's great. Now let's, talk about <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> let's get to the juice. Okay, cool. Okay. First question in one word. Um, what is feminine power for you? Mm, one word, huh? Mm, well, I, I mean, the first word that comes to me is empowerment, although that is a little bit redundant because you asked what does, you know, female power mean to you? But um, I guess my one word would be strength. Mm, love it. Um, Alex, how do you take care of yourself? How do you take care of your soul, your body? What are some of your non-negotiables? Ooh, that's a good one. So meditation has become a non-negotiable for me um, in a lot of ways. And what's important to know about that is that I was never a meditator. I used to be one of those people that like couldn't tolerate sitting with my emotions enough. Um, and, and I would be like, oh, this is making me anxious. It wasn't making me anxious, but it's just I had never let myself sit with my emotions. <clears throat> so starting to do that, there was quite the backlog to release. And, and once I understood that and really brought meditation more into my life, then that, um, that opened the door for me to receive more guidance and then that's why, you know, now I'm a shamanic apprentice um, and I'm going through that. And that has been transformational in my understanding of like um, the traumas that have happened to me, the, this whole pain situation that I've been in and all of that has really um, given me more tools. Um, so that one definitely is like um, happens no matter what. Um, I also have my non-negotiable is I have an energetic shielding um, process that I do every morning at night. So it's essentially like I set the intention of what I will or will not allow into my day that day. And so I ask for what I need and what I want and what is going to get done. And it is amazing to watch like problems kind of, you're like, I see you problem but you're not actually in my life like this. It skates by you. And that's super duper um, helpful for um, my life. And then I, you know, one thing that has really happened over the years is that I used to be one of those people that like obsessed about my food. And it started with um, kind of an eating disorder where I would round my five calorie stick of gum up to the nearest hundred calories, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then once I transitioned to functional medicine and ways of eating, I kind of brought that rigidity and stress with me to the food where I was like, I have to, you know, I started on paleo and it was like, oh no, you know, only paleo and all this meal prep and I was making three meals a day and it was just so much time and I've actually allowed myself to take a step back more and to um, receive help with that and also just I realized that that perfect five to ten percent I was going for for my food you know if I just shifted gears to have more fun less stress less worry more peace if I could find that in my life the, that was going to be way more important than like the 5% improvement I could have in my food. So actually for me, a big portion of healing has been finding more of a balance, which means um, there are more like – I go for vegetables that are already cut up so I can just dump them in the pan, right? And I don't have as much guilt around like, well, I should be cutting those up and like dicing and chopping and whatever. And, um, and some of that, like there have been times where I, I couldn't afford that anyways, but, but, you know, moving into there, I really have switched to being like, I want to have good food, but I also have the intention that this cannot be an overarching stress stressor for me that's going to knock me off. And so 
the filter that I'm making food decisions by is really like, how can I fuel my body the best while minimizing stress and overwhelm in my life? And then, um, yeah. <laughs> as a woman, that is a tall order, <laughs> right? Yeah. Exactly. And so, um, a lot of it is I schedule my self care. Um, it's almost like, you know, the concept of paying yourself first, that kind of, it's the same thing where in my schedule, I first schedule things that I need to feel good. So for me, um, I go to a chiropractor, I do acupuncture, I do yoga, you know, I do massages, things that help me control pain and all of that needs to happen for me to be a functional woman helping other women in society. In society. And so um, it, it was one of those realizations that if I don't feel good, I will not do what I am here to do. And so actually realizing that was so helpful for me because then it, it instead of me being the last thing on the list, I had to then go through and it is that kind of breaking the curse of the good girl is that you'll have to learn how to put yourself first and take care of you. And then from that full cup, everyone else will be taken care of. And I've seen that in action and now I believe it. But at first it kind of felt like a leap of faith a little bit. Yeah. And I have to tell you, and maybe, I don't know, maybe it's, it's not relevant to everybody, but I personally find that being uh, a descendant of people who went through the communists, you know, the Soviet communism, there is a lot of healing that needs to happen there. Um, yes. That right. on its own, it's like, it's a big, big piece of my own kind of like, you know, process. So, um, right. yeah, I get it. Yeah. I understand. Yes. Okay. I, I, especially with like lack of food, it was just, mm. um, I really, I really had to work through some safety concepts. Like I yeah. did not feel safe because I grew up in like, there was no food. There was no, you know, standing in line to pick up like the, your allotted bag of sugar, right? You remember, <laughs> um, that, that kind of stuff definitely impact. And, and I continue to bring that to here where I have access to all this food. And yet I was limiting myself because it didn't, I, I couldn't, my identity wasn't in line with yeah. eating well. It just didn't fit. I was this like poor immigrant. And that was the mentality I brought to my physical health. And I didn't even know that until I brought it up. I mean, um, but the, one of the best things I've ever heard is if you want to know what your um, underlying beliefs are, look around your life. So where are you getting good results? That's where, you know, you have good or um, productive beliefs. I don't even want to say good or bad. And if something's not working and you're not getting the results, there are absolutely underlying beliefs that are keeping you from reaching there. And, and that's the hard job. Like we do functional testing. We give people protocols with supplements and food and none of that is honestly hard. Like anyone can go pee on some strips, send it in, have us tell them what to take. Like none of that is actually hard, but living and like figuring out what your beliefs are and excavating them and feeling your emotions, that's the hard work. Yes. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the, the mother-daughter dynamic? I, I mean, it comes up a lot in my practice. Um, and you know this, not every woman is a mother, but every woman is a daughter. And so yes. it will be interesting to know how do you think that your relationship with your mom shaped uh, to, you know, help to shape who you are today? Yeah, yeah. Oh, a lot. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> a I, can, lot. I can see why that comes up for people all the time. A lot, a lot, a lot. Um, so my mom um, is like just a superwoman. <laughs> like she now granted it's not like in a healthy way or anything. Um, and so I had, I have a great deal of respect for my mom because she, because of what she's been able to accomplish. She holds three PhDs. Wow. Um, oh my gosh. Know, yeah. Three, she's had three PhDs from Russia. She had, um, she, right. She composes her own music, like complicated. This isn't like Britney Spears or whatever. It's, um, 
<laughs> She's a classical musician. She writes, like she composes her own stuff. She writes poetry and sets it to the music. She cooks. She cooks three meals a day from scratch for my family. You know, my dad has like, <laughs> I was like packing his lunch one time a couple of years back and he was like, you didn't wash the apple. Your mom always washes the apple for me. And I'm like, you are so oh ridiculous. Like I, mom is just, <laughs> You know, and and so just ask um, for my mom. How is your libido? I'm just curious. <laughs> uh, not until we worked on her Dutch test and got it back. Um, okay. It wasn't. Great. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, she was only sleeping three, four hours. I mean, I vividly remember being in high school, and her hormones were not balanced, right? So I remember being in like high school and middle school, and I would go downstairs for like a glass of water in the middle of the night, and she's there repainting. Like it wasn't uncommon. Um, to come down and like a different part of the house would be painted some other color. Like she's just so energetic and just really, and, and I know that there are issues with that. Like it's not healthy to not sleep. She's had a lot of hormone issues that she also didn't get answers with. And it's only after I became kind of an expert in it that she got the help that she needed, which was really mm. kind of um, sad for me. But um but at the same time, I always had this belief like, God, I'm never going to be as awesome as, as her. Like, um, and she was very much like, she doesn't think that she's a tiger mom, but the kids do, <laughs> you know, so I don't know. There's a disconnect there. Like she gets mad if we say she was a tiger mom, but I always, you know, um, I had any homework that was less than a nine ninety percent you know I just wasn't supposed to get grades that weren't an A or if I got an A it was like why didn't you get an A plus um, and I played piano competitively and all of that stuff and she really pushed me there um, and so I had a, I have a lot of self-worth issues that I internalized even though, I mean, I know she loves me and she's proud of me, but she just was like, you're capable of more. I'm going to push you to do more. And, um, and as an adult, I've really had to unpackage like what was hers and what was actually mine. Like what did I want versus yeah. what did she want? Um, plus I don't know about how your family is, but Russian culture is very like family centric. Yeah. So she also, um, you know, wants me to visit a lot and call every day. And like, you know, I just don't always have time for that sort of thing. Um, and so we've, that's the boundaries that we've had to more establish as, as kind of the go girl, like I would always do that. And then to have the transition from like, I'm not going to just cause you want to talk doesn't mean I'm available kind of thing. Um, and so those ex expectations I had to just say, I don't consent to that. Um, so we're going to switch. But it's been, I mean, I think all the like mother-daughter wounds are there that we come up. But at the same time, um, I will say this is probably the best relationship version I've had with my mom the whole time. Um, and so it's been empowering, but it was definitely a journey in it uh i i internalized yeah for me for me too for me before living in alignment with my cycle i had to heal my mother wound because i like you said like this piece of like individuating myself and like knowing like who am i and who is she i felt like it's almost like i was an extension extension of her of her and it, it, yeah, it's totally something that is part, I call this healing the feminine and it's, it's just part of it. It's, it's, it's all, this is part of our healing journey. It's not just the acne, <laughs> it's, not, it's not just the nope. weight loss, although that's where, you know, most of us begin, yeah. but it's, it, it's, it's, I love, I love how your approach is very holistic and it's like, no girl like yes I'm, I can help you with the like the physical aspect but you need to know that this is not where it ends and you will only you need to be open to um you know healing other pieces of you so I love it so much all right my next three questions what makes you feel confident and you can just say it in one word yeah sure what makes me feel confident is um showing up for myself, the realization of no one else has to parent me. I'm my own parent. 
Love that. What makes you feel energized? Ooh, well, doing this makes me feel energized, but really when Megan and I are learning something new and learning how to integrate it for ourselves and for our women, we get so jazzed. I mean, we could be like exhausted. It's 8 p.m. We're troubleshooting stuff. And then we'll start talking about like a new, we're doing, um, we're adding to our program, a parasympathetic component. It's like a mini training within our group. And like instantly, well, I'll just be like, yeah, let's do this. Like all this energy is back. So I really, really love the work that we do in that way. Amazing. What makes you feel sexy? Ooh, what makes me feel sexy? Um, <laughs> you know, it's funny. I just don't, I'm a little bit too goofy to like, it's not that I don't feel sexy. It's just that I've never jived too much with like the sexy vibe. Because like, I mean, my husband will make fun of me. He's like, you would have been the worst stripper. Like you cannot take it seriously <laughs> at all. So it's just one of those things that I'm like, um, I will say, um, I don't see myself necessarily as like a sexy person, but I will say when I feel sexy is like when I'm dancing and really connected to my body, it's like then that sensuality comes through. And I will say from like a mother grandmother wound, I had a lot of stuff around sexuality in certain terms of like, don't touch down there. It's bad or it's gross or it's dirty or whatever. And so I think the other thing is I had 14 boy cousins that were older. And so I grew up in like all boys. Mm. Um, and so I think some of it is a little bit of a problem, you know, like a, that I don't necessarily identify with that. And I am working on it. But yeah, that that's what I that's probably the area that I feel the most with. Love it so much. Alex, this has been so much fun and so informative. Thank you so, so much for coming on the show and sharing all of your wisdom. Uh, before I let you go, can you tell the listeners how they can connect with you? Um, how can they find you online? Um, now is the time for all of that. And I'll make sure to link up to all of that in the show notes. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you for having me. This was such a good time. Um, and I, I loved your question. So that was great. Um, the, the way that you can come hang out with us we're most active on our social media or on our Instagram page on social media. And so it's at zesty underscore ginger. And um, Megan and I are on there a lot, teaching, sharing um, all of that good stuff. And then you do, especially when people um, go and like subscribe is to make sure they, they don't miss stuff from us. Then we also do a lot of announcement for like our group and uh, freebies that we're doing and all sorts of stuff. Which, by the way, um, when is this coming out? Um, probably sometime in March. Okay, perfect. Um, in that case, we, um, you know, re if if your if your ears peaked with the functional lab work and protocols and all that stuff, we do have our healthy hormones group program that's kicking off March seventeenth, and um, we're happy to hop on the phone with anyone that's interested. Um, and so. Uh, social media, um, or I keep saying social media when I mean Instagram, that in my mind is the social media because right. that's in the there. only place <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> where we hang out. Exactly. Right. We do and have, you have the podcast. For yes. Facebook, we like, well, for we also have a free Facebook group. It's Zesty Ginger Support and we pop in there with free you know, with lives and stuff like that. Um, so you can find us there. And then podcast is four phase cycle podcast with zesty ginger. Um, we are on season five and it's actually right now we're releasing the advanced pod class series. So the, the introductory was season one that those 24 pod classes I told you about. And then season five is the advanced version where we're actually going through how to interpret testing and stuff like that. So lots of details there. And then, of course, our website is sdginger.com, and you can contact us through there and read all about what we do and stuff. Beautiful. All Alex, right. thank you so much. This has been so great, so much fun. I'm so happy to be connected to you. Uh, say, send all my love to Megan as well. Um, I, I, you know, too bad she couldn't be here, but it's okay. I, I consume you guys all the time, so I feel like she's here with us. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, she wanted to be here. Unfortunately, she couldn't. It's okay. Um, yeah. Is there anything uh, you want to leave the listeners uh, with before, we, before I wrap this up? 
Yeah, just um, I would say if you're listening to this, um, do just if you can, if you're not driving, close your eyes, put your hand on your heart, one hand on your heart, one hand on like where your uterus is over your lower pelvis and just take three deep breaths and just feel what it feels like to connect with your body and to listen to it. Beautiful. Thank you so much. All right. Wait, before you go, I hope you've enjoyed this episode. And if you did, I want to know about it. So snap a picture of you listening to this episode and share it on Instagram or Facebook. On Instagram, you can tag me at Dorit Palvanov Coaching. So Dorit is spelled as D-O-R-I-T and Palvanov spelled as P-A-L-V-A-N-O-V coaching so it's all one word or you can use the hashtag confident energized and sexy mama podcast you see my personal goal beyond having amazing conversations with guests or hosting solo episodes is to increase the visibility for this platform and these messages to be shared and heard by women who need it the most. And there's no way that I can do this on my own. So I'm asking you, the incredible community of confident, energized, and sexy mamas to help me with this goal. So whether you're coming to me through iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever you're listening to the show from, please rate, review, and subscribe to the show. This would mean the world to me, and it's so, so helpful for other mothers who are looking for this information. So thank you so much for listening, and I'll catch you next time. Bye for now.